Okay, I'm Megan Pistoli Shaw, the Education and Outreach and Communications Coordinator with Lilo Prism, and I will be facilitating today's discussion. Also joining us today is Caroline Marshner with the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Here's an overview of our agenda. We will share the current state of Hemlock Willie Adelgid, Hemlock Ecology, conservation and management strategies, funding along with ways you can get involved. And we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. For those who aren't familiar with the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management known as Lilo Prism, we are one of eight prisms that span the state of New York Creating a network of partnerships is an integrative approach to invasive species management. The PRISM network is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination between the Department of Environmental Conservation and various host organizations. Slilo encompasses the five counties of Oneida, Oswego, Jefferson, and Lewis, and St. Lawrence. And we are hosted by the Nature Conservancy, and we collaborate with our partners to protect our lands and waters from the impacts of invasive species. And I'd like to invite you to attend an upcoming survey training being led by Slilo Prism and our partners with the Tug Hill Tomorrow Land Trust, scheduled to occur on March 16th at 10 a.m. at the beautiful Salmon River Falls Unique Management Area located in Orwell, New York. And participants will get a hands-on training on how to survey for Hemlock Willie Adelgid and practice using the IMAP Invasives mobile app to report observations. Registration is required and you can visit our event page to get details. Now I'd like to introduce Caroline Marshner with the Invasive Species Extension Associate with Cornell University's New York State Hemlock Initiative. Caroline's background is in general ecology with experience in forest prairie and riparian ecosystems. And she received her bachelor's degree in environmental biology from Colo Colorado College and her master's degree in environmental science from Miami University. Caroline has been with the New York State Hemlock Initiative since 2015, where she coordinates outreach efforts and works with partners to facilitate conservation planning and assist with program management. Carrie, we welcome you. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? I can. Great. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for, for coming to learn about Hemlock Willie Adelgid and how to plan for its management. Um, just going to get my screen all tidy here, and then I'll be ready to roll. So I'm going to do a quick introduction, quicker than usual, to Hemlock Trees and HWA, and then we'll get we'll get right to it. So hemlock trees are what we call a foundation species, which means that they create the ecosystem that other species depend on. Um, this is where they are in New York. The darker the color, the more hemlock. And so you can see our Tug Hill region, in case you didn't already know, has a lot of hemlock, um, as does the, the ring right here around the southern Adirondacks. We also have a lot in the Catskills and in the southern, southern tier area. Hemlocks fill a pretty unique niche in our, in our New York forests. They are only shade adapted hemlock. So each one of those needles is specially adapted to um, photosynthesize from even from the sun flecks that come in through a pretty dense forest canopy. So as a result, they often grow in um, steep valleys, along riversides, and in shaded areas. They also can grow up to a sapling and then just hang out for sometimes up to 100 years, waiting for enough light to arrive in their, in their neighborhood to grow into a mature tree. They support a food web of about 400 forest species. Um, a lot of these are the ones that live in the surrounding forest, but um, some species are really pretty specifically dependent on hemlock. We have some birds that really depend on hemlocks and even pretty common things like porcupines really use hemlocks a lot in the winter time for food. Hemlocks also provide a pretty unique little 
habitat. Um, in the summertime, when you walk into a hemlock grove, you can feel that it's cooler than the area around it. And in fact, the area underneath the hemlock is about 10 degrees centigrade cooler than the air above it in the summertime. In the wintertime, you walk into that same hemlock grove and it feels warmer because the evergreen foliage is blocking the wind. And so it's again, a refuge from extreme weather. Hemlocks also provide ecosystem services to our um, aquatic landscape. Um, they help keep stream water cool um, through a couple of mechanisms and clean by filtering out um, runoff before it gets to those, to those ecosystems. And this is especially important for some of our cold water species like the trout that we love to fish for, which um, an alternate name for them is hemlock, um, hemlock trout, hemlock trout instead of brook, brook trout. And this is what we don't want to see in New York. Uh, this is Pisgah National Forest, and all of the dead trees that you can see there are, are hemlocks that have been killed by hemlock woolly adelgid, which is what we're here in part to talk about today, which is a forest pest that's new to our, to our shores as of about 120 years ago, but new to New York as of the late 80s. So here's where HWA is in New York. It arrived down in the, in the city, Long Island area in the 80s, started moving up through the Hudson Valley, in from Connecticut, um, into the Finger Lakes and the Capital Region. And lately it's been also spreading in Western New York and in the Lake George area. Now in, in your region, a lot of this, was just identified in the last couple of years. So uh, th this is a map of HWA presence and absence data from IMAP invasives. And all these little orange hexagons are positive records for HWA. All of this has been found in the last two or three years right along the lake. Um, this record is from Three Rivers Wildlife Management Area and it was just put in last weekend by um, some of our volunteers. So I think we should expect to find more HWA up in this area, either now or sometime soon. It's also coming in from these locations up in here. And this is um, Rookwood um, Park, State Park, and some other areas where we've had HWA for a few years now in the capital region. So we should expect it to start coming this way as well into into your prism. This is what HWA looks like. Um, it looks like white woolly masses that you find on twigs of HWA at the base of the needles. These guys right here. If you take that wool away, this is what an HWA looks like. Uh, these little pores here in these plates are where they make their wool. And this crazy child's straw looking thing dangling down is its mouth parts. Um, it inserts this, it's called a stylet, into the twig of the HWA and sucks out starches. And we don't think it's the removal of the starches that kills the tree. We think it's that there, when you have an infestation like this, where you have so many HWA, all the little wounds cause enough damage in the twig that it, the tree can't get its sap out to the end of the of these twiglets to make new foliage and that's where HWA makes new new needles and so after a while they starve because they can't make new needles and to make more food we think that's what happens um, in the south HWA is killing trees in four to ten years up here in the north um, for a nice cold snap in the winter time can can knock back HWA populations. It almost never actually completely removes them, but it can give our trees a breather for a year or two while the HWA populations build back up. So in the North, it's taking more like six to 20 years to, uh, to, to kill hemlocks from HWA. HWA has two generations a year. Um, 
the overwintering generation starts out as an uh, starts out as an egg uh, in the late spring, early summer, and then they find a place to settle, stick those little mouth parts into the tree, and then they never move again after that. Once they settle right here, and this generation goes into a state of like suspended animation. It's like hibernation, but it's not in the winter, so it's called estivation. And then in the fall, when the weather starts to get colder, they wake up and start growing. Um, right about this time of year, the adults start to lay eggs for the spring generation. And that spring generation hatches out, grows right away, and lays another generation that is next year's overwintering generation. That's a lot of uses of the word generation, but hopefully it made sense. So why is this such a problem? Each of these HWA individuals reproduces asexually in Eastern North America, where we have all females and they, they all produce eggs. So just one insect arriving in your area can start a whole new infestation. They have two generations a year, so they have two opportunities for exponential growth. And we don't have any real predators for this, for this insect, so there's nothing stopping that exponential growth. And that's why we're having such problems on the East Coast and such high mortality of hemlocks. We would love it if you could get out and do some surveying. Um, there are several opportunities Megan's going to talk about for volunteering. And if you would report what you find with IMAP Invasives. Um, and I'll talk, Megan's actually going to talk about our, our volunteer projects. So what do you do now that you have you live in this beautiful region with a whole bunch of hemlocks and HWA is coming for them? Um, there are two different kinds of management that we can think about. In the short term, chemical management of HWAs really are the only, the only tr trick in our bag. Um, in the long term, we're hoping mm -hmm. biological control will be a landscape scale long-term solution to this pest. The options for treatment are, there are two chemicals. There's imidacloprid. This is a slow acting chemical. It takes about a year, a year and a half to become effective, but then it lasts up to five years or even seven in ideal conditions, but the average is about five. The other one is dinotephuron. Dinotephuron starts working just right away within a few weeks. It's killing HWA in your tree, but it only lasts for about a year. Um, imidacloprid is widely available through several different um, application methods, although only one of them is available for homeowner use. Dinotephrine is only available um, to pesticide applicators. So what we're looking at here is what a lot of large land managers like DEC, New York State Parks, have opted for in New York, which is a basal bark application, where you take the, a very small amount of the chemical and mix it up in water in a backpack sprayer, and then apply it to the bottom six feet or so of the tree's trunk. And then the chemical soaks in through the bark and goes up into the, the canopy of the tree. Um, the reason that we've opted for this is that dinotephuran, that fast moving one, is only available as a basal bark spray in New York. And so if you're going to be using dinotephuran, in your, in your treatment, because you have very old trees that really need help right away, or you have a really heavy infestation, or you're right on the leading edge of HWA movement and you wanna make sure that, that your forest is not helping spread HWA, so you wanna kill stuff right away, then you have to use this method because that's the only way you can apply that chemical here in New York. And and we would never apply dinotephuron without adding imidacloprid because it just doesn't make sense to go out there again a year later when you could be using imidacloprid and you don't have to go back for five years. 
If you're just going to use a bit of corporate, you can do the um, soil drench application that's available for homeowners. And one of the reasons to um, be hyper vigilant about HWA on your trees and treat early is that imidacloprid costs about a third as much as dinotefiran does. And so the cost of treatment very early when your trees can handle some more damage while they wait for the treatment to become effective uh, is much more cost effective than applying both chemicals. Imidacloprid and dinotefiran are both neonicotinoids. The, um, those are the most commonly used insecticides in the world um, because they replaced some insecticides that were very toxic for humans. Um, they have less off-target impacts than some of the older chemicals, um, but they are, they appear to be a significant risk to pollinators. And they might have other impacts on ecosystems. So there being um, that there's legislation in New York that's being looked at in this legislative session about um, restricting their use even further. So I don't know if that homeowner application is going to be available after this legislative session. We'll find out. Um, if you're going to use these chemicals, which are used in on um, field crop seeds. Well over 90% of the field crops that are planted in New York have neonicotinoids and I think imidacloprid specifically on the seed coats. They're in flea and tick collars. They're in a whole bunch of things out there. If you're gonna use it somewhere, this is a good place to use these chemicals because hemlocks are wind pollinated. Um, they don't produce any nectar. They're not of interest to pollinators. So these are not going to impact your pollinators. There's also been quite a lot of research done on off-target impacts of imidacloprid when it's used on hemlocks. And the off-target impacts have been pretty minimal. And you only have to do it once every five years. When you're thinking about the risks versus the uh, the rewards of treating your trees versus not treating them. Um, do remember that it's not either I treat my trees and I have potential um, risks that I'm not comfortable with, or I just leave them there. Um, it's either I treat my trees and have some, some risks that I'm not comfortable with, or my hemlocks all eventually die, and that that foundation species that creates the ecosystem of eastern hemlock is gone, and the habitat is gone for all of the animals that depend on that. And that causes a cascade of ecological effects because you've lost that foundation species. In the long term, we're hoping that we can um, move on from chemical treatment, which we think of as a short-term um, stopgap measure to biological control, where we have an insect that's in our ecosystem that eats these, these uh, tree pests and keeps keeps the populations low enough that our hemlock trees can survive them, as they do many other diseases and, and pests like hemlock looper and hemlock borer and a bunch of other things. But this is, takes a while to develop, and then it takes a while for the populations to build up in the landscape so that they can protect the trees. And so if we want to keep the trees that are on our landscapes now alive, we need to be treating them while while a biological solution is hopefully developed. Everybody else I work with here at the Hemlock Initiative is working very hard on that. And we're hoping that we will be able to come up with something. And it's not just us. There are labs all across the East Coast working on biological control for hemlock woolly adelgid. One of those is uh, our Laracobius beetles. These are little beetles um, that eat HWA in the wintertime. 
the species we work with the most is from the Pacific Northwest. Um, we collect foliage from, from the Pacific Northwest and bring it here to a special facility where we um, rear, we, we wait for the larvae of these to come out to pupate in the soil, which is what they do in the summertime while HWA is estivating. And then we hang on to them until they're adults and release them in the fall. We've been working with these beetles since 2009. And we have, as of the spring, we found establishment at 11 sites in New York. Um, this is what they look like when they're doing their thing, eating HWA on a hemlock twig. And this is our map of releases and where we, the stars are where we have established populations. Um, you can, if you imagine the growing zone map laid across this for New York, you can see that they're mostly in um, growing zone 6A or warmer. The other species that we're working with are uh, Leucotraxis silverflies. Um, these are from the Pacific Northwest and they feed on the spring generation. And we, we believe it's going to be really important to have something that eats winter, winter HWA and something that also feeds on the spring generation. Otherwise, one or the other has this opportunity for exponential growth. Um, these guys eat the eggs of HWA and we've been working with them pretty seriously since 2017. Um, these are the silver flies. As you can see, they're not very imposing. They're very, very small. And their larvae, which are what eat the HWA, are even smaller. They're hard to find without a microscope. These are the HWA eggs that it's going after. Um, we have released in all of these places so far since 2017. And we are um, happy to report that one of our colleagues, one of our colleagues from another, another research project has um, captured uh, a, a leucotraxis from a New York forest that was either at the direct offspring of something that we released or a five generations out offspring of something we released. So we know that there, we have at least somewhere, we have some establishment. And we're hoping to have more solid news on that in the upcoming year. So what do you do as a landowner or a land manager in Salilo, knowing HWA is coming? Um, you can only treat, I probably should have mentioned this when I was talking about the chemical treatments, you can only treat about a 180 um, diameter inches of tree a year with these chemicals, which is not a ton. So how do you pick where you're going to treat first? Which trees are you gonna fix first? And which stands are you gonna save? If you have a hundred acres, you're probably not gonna save every stand on your property. And so you're gonna to have to make some hard decisions about where you're going to spend your effort working on hemlock conservation for your property. Um, if you're looking at an individual property, this is a map of the hike preserve, which is in the capital region. And all of these brightly colored polygons are all different ecosystems that have hemlock in them. And when they identified HWI in their property, they were just a little at sea. Like, <laughs> we can't possibly treat all this. We're just, we're just a, you know, a, a preserve. We don't have that much money. Um, where do we focus our energy? And then the prisms are also having the same conversations. You know, they, this is, happens to be the Catskills prison. All these colored flecks are where hemlock are in the Catskills. Where do you start focusing your, your efforts? So we worked with a whole bunch of colleagues around the state to develop a prioritization tool to help people answer this question. Um, and in its current state, it, had, it has two pieces. There is a, a Word document over here that you can just read through to help you think about, okay, how do these things apply on my property and where do I wanna spend my time and effort? 
Or you can also use the Excel file. If you are working across multiple properties, if you want to apply for funding and you want to show that you've thought this through, um, or if you're trying to do a more quantitative assessment, then you can use the Excel file to help, help um, come up with a more quantitative assessment than just thinking it through. The first thing in there is an, an initial three questions to answer uh, before you even start the tool. Are you at the very leading edge of HWA in, in New York? If you are, you should probably treat your trees because that's going to slow, slow the spread of HWA through your area, your region. Um, if you have old growth, unless there's a really compelling reason not to, you should probably treat it because that's an incredibly vanishingly rare resource. And if you're planning to take the trees down anyway, just take them down, don't treat them. But anything else other than those three very easy decisions, we suggest you think through these things I'm about to tell you about. And then the way you can use this tool is figure out where your stands are. You can use an aerial map, that um, the a aerial photo that was taken in the winter um, to pick out where your conifers are. And then um, some of these questions you can answer just by looking, looking at where those are on a map. And then get out and look at your stands and uh, answer a few questions out there about how healthy are your stands, how dense are your stands, are there any unique things about those stands? And then you, you can score, if you want to, on that Excel sheet as many, as many different metrics as you choose to. As long as you do the same metrics for all of your stands, you'll get a useful number at the end that will say the higher the number, the more important that stand is relative to the other stands that you ranked. And hopefully that 30,000 foot view of here is my property and here's the stands I think are most important can help you prepare for management and conservation of those high priority stands. You can focus your survey efforts on it. You can plan for treatment in those stands. Um, and you can also think about what you're going to do with the stands that you're not going to treat, which are probably going to die. I'm just gonna skip that. Um, one of the most interesting projects that's happened in the last six or seven years for me has been working with the Owasco Lake Watershed, Watershed Association. Um, who decided to really go all in for um, hemlock conservation in the Owasco Lake watershed. And so I built this map for them where I just, I did just what I said. I found aerial imagery and I circled the places where there were conifers that looked like hemlocks to me. And, uh, and I did a quick assessment of like, um, how big and how dense was the stand? Was it right near a stream where it might be providing resources for the keeping the stream cool? Um, and some uh, some other basic things. And then I ranked them and, and colored them. The red ones were the, the really important ones. And then um, Dana Hall got together a bunch of volunteers. I helped he trained um, helped him train them. And then they went out and surveyed. And this is where they found HWA in that first year and didn't find HWA for the green. And then they ranked, ranked the stands and applied for and secured over $150,000 in funding to do treatments. And they've continued to survey and treat for the last three years. And they're almost done with that project. And they've treated thousands and thousands of trees in, in the Owasco Lake watershed. Um, somebody asked to see that this Catskill map. So we had a, an employee who spent a year surveying in the Beaver Kill watershed in the Catskills. And again, I went through and outlined all the places that looked like they had hemlock from aerial imagery and ranked them based on this one. This one, we knew there was an old growth stand in here somewhere. So that one came out high and these were right along the main stem. So they came out high. Um, and then she went through and she found so much more HWA 
than she was expecting. But Shales did a lot of talks and reached out to the landowners in this area, and they have also been applying for funding as a, as a sort of a landscape scale group. So these regional groups, um, somebody um, decides that they want to take action for across their landscape, because that's really a great way to get funding for um, treatment on private property. The next step is to, to reach out to the people that you think have hemlocks in your area and to also build a survey team, often volunteers, I'm happy to help train them. Um, go out and do a bunch of surveys, score the properties, and then you can apply for funding. And when you apply for funding, you can say, look, we've done all this legwork and we know what's going on here and we have a plan for treatment and we have these landowners that are game. And that really helps when you're, when you're submitting a proposal to show that you've really thought through the project and you have buy-in. So, so far we've got projects like this. There are projects like this happening in Skinny Atlas Watershed, Wasco Lake Watershed. There's somebody working on funding um, south of Letchwork. Um, there's one in the Honeywai Watershed. Canandaigua Lake Watershed Association is starting to build something like this as well. And then there's another group out in Western New York, in Buffalo. All of these people are doing this kind of landscape scale. Let's try to figure out how to develop a treatment plan across our area. And then Slilo and APIP both have these regional, you know, big regional projects where they're thinking through the same kinds of questions. So what are those traits that we suggest that you think of within that tool? There are five different categories. There's stand traits, um, things about the hemlocks themselves, um, services they might be providing to your aquatic ecosystem, services they might be pro providing to the terrestrial ecosystems, um, cultural values, values that they provide directly to humans, and questions about sustainability for those hemlock stands. Stand traits are things like, how healthy is the stand now? How big is it? How dense is it? Um, are there other environmental stressors? Is there a soil compaction because there's a logging road that was cut through it recently? Is there, are there other forest pests like um, along at hemlock scale? Is it right near water? Um, and then ecosystem services are things like, is this keeping the stream cool for cold water fish assemblage, which would be really important. Um, the, the hemlocks right along the stream provide direct shade to the stream. And then the hemlocks that are elsewhere in the, in the headwaters of, of, a, of, a, of a stream um, hold snow later into the spring than the deciduous trees do. So that's another way that they keep, help keep streams cool. They also help stabilize stream flow because hemlocks are transpiring more actively in the spring and fall, and they don't transpire as much in the summertime as the hardwoods do. So when we have an overabundance of water in our systems, the hemlocks are actively pulling water out of the ground. And in the summertime, when we're often in drought, they are not pulling out as much water as the hardwoods are. And that's how they help keep stream flows stable. Um, I don't think any of those are going to happen. And then for terrestrial ecosystems values, is it a really nice old forest? Do you see like um, a not flat surface, like a pit and mound topography that would that would indicate that this this area has never been plowed? Um, if that's the case, then this that's a pretty nice forest. It's probably a forest that's never been completely cut and plowed, and that's more unusual than you would think uh, when we look across our landscape. A lot of our, a lot of our land has been, has been plowed sometime in the last 300 years and then the forests have regrown. Is it a rare ecosystem? Um, like, a, like a hemlock swamp is a pretty unusual ecosystem. Do you have any rare species like the um, spreading globe flower, Trollium laxius, which we have in the Finger Lakes, that there are only about 12 sites in the world that have that? And one of our hemlock stands on at the Coming Nature Center has that. 
And so that's a high priority stand. Um, is it a really high quality habitat or is it, you know, a hemlock stand that has a lot of oriental bittersweet and honeysuckle in the understory and all the other invasive problems that we have widespread across our landscape? Are there hemlock dependent species like the four birds um, that use hemlock a lot? Or even, you know, evidence of winter porcupine feeding and other more common species that really depend on those hemlock. And then it's important to think about what the slope is like. Um, slope is kind of a two-edged sword. The steeper the slope, the more you might want to think about hanging on to those hemlocks because they, um, if they die pretty quickly, they might hang on for a long time. But if they die pretty quickly, then um, you might have a little bit of slope instability. You might not, but you might. Um, but it's also a lot more expensive to treat on tre steep slopes. So you can think of them as more important or more challenging to treat. Cultural values is, is, is the person who manages the property ever going to treat? Um, are there hazard trees? You know, is, are these infested trees right along the roads that you drive in and out of your property on? Or um, right along a, a trail that the public uses? Or right near a building that they could fall and squish? Um, natural or cultural resources, is this an important traditional stand for the um, Native American peoples from your area? Or is it getting a lot of use by, by people? Or is it in the view shed for a beautiful, you know, uh, a treasured uh, national park or a state park, or something like that? And is it a place where you can, can use the treatment to talk about invasive species management? That might be useful as well. And then uh, sustainability, is, are these trees going to be there for the long term? Um, is it feasible to treat them? Like you, these are probably pretty important to keep alive because they're kind of holding all of this topsoil in place. Um, something else will come in when they go down, but but these guys seem like they're doing a pretty critical job there. Um, but up here, they're going to be more expensive to treat because somebody's going to have to go to the top of that slope, rope themselves in, and come down on the rope to treat. So. Is it feasible to treat there? Um, is that stand gonna be there in the long term? Hemlocks are probably gonna stay on our landscape in New York under all but the direst of the climate scenarios. Um, but if they're already on a really dry site, that might not be the best stand to focus all of your attention on because if it's already really dry and we're expecting to see more summer droughts, um, they might just not be healthy in the long term. Uh, and then deer pressure is good to think about. And it's not, it's a little counterintuitive, but the higher the deer pressure, the more likely when these trees die, they're going to get replaced by some sort of invasive plant um, or a low value plant or tree. Um, the lower the deer pressure, the more likely something that, that, is, that is a nicer a nicer tree is going to come in. So if you have really high deer pressure, you might prioritize treating your HWA. Um, so my final thoughts are right now is the time to survey and plan um, and make some decisions about before you have to act so that when you do find HWA on your property, you know what you're going to do. You've already figured out who can do treatments in your area. You know how much you can afford to do, and you know where you want to focus your effort. In the near term, conservation of hemlocks is really critical. We don't have a way to keep our hemlocks on the landscape in the long term right now until we get a biocontrol solution developed and out in the world. And in the long term, here at the New York State Hemlock Initiative, we believe that this is uh, an important part of the long-term solution for Eastern Hemlock. 
that's pretty much my talk. I'm going to, I see there's been a ton of questions. I'm going to wait for Megan to give me the thumbs up to go through all of those. But if you want to reach out to us, we post on Facebook and on Instagram, and you can email us at New York State Hemlock Initiative at cornell.edu. That goes to me, goes to our field manager, Nick, and it also goes to our director. So hopefully one of us will be able to provide a good answer to your question. And we have a lot more information about HWA, its management, all the different management options in New York, um, volunteer opportunities, all that stuff um, at our website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, we are going to hold for questions. We only just have a few more things to share, and then we're going to have plenty of time for open discussion. So just hang tight, and we'll get to those questions momentarily. Uh, I did just want to share the current state of Hemlock Willie Adelgid in the Slilo region. So Slilo Prism, we have an early detection team that surveys for HWA each season in collaboration with our partners. And we strategize our survey efforts using presence data and IMAP and have found that HWA appears to be spreading along the eastern Lake Ontario shoreline, which may be due to the warmer temperatures along the lake. Uh, in, two, in 2021, we found HWA for the first time in the Slilo region in Oswego County at Independence Park, Camp Hollis, and the Oswego County Reforestation area. In 2021, HWA was confirmed at the Noise Bird Sanctuary, and our partners with New York State Parks confirmed HWA at Mexico Point and Selkirk Shores in 2022. And then this slide just shows HWA management actions that have been taken or that are being considered in the Slilo region at confirmed HWA sites. And most sites have received insecticide treatments or there are plans to do so. And Mexico Point had biocontrol agents released and there is potential to release more biocontrol agents in the Slilo region again this year. And we're interested in learning of hem hemlock stands that exist in the Slilo region that have an estimated 100 or more mature hemlock trees. And as mentioned, we have identified sites to survey for HWA using IMAP invasives, um, HWA confirmed observation data, but we'd like to learn more about the hemlock stands that exist in our region. And we can use this information to strategize our early detection efforts. Uh, we do have a Google form that I'll send out in a follow-up email that you can use to share any hemlock stand data that you may have. And I'd like to note that the information shared doesn't guarantee that we will conduct a survey at that site, but it will help us to prioritize our survey efforts. So next, I'm just gonna showcase a few opportunities for you to get involved in the Slilo region and beyond. Uh, we do encourage everyone who conducts surveys for hemlock, willy delgid, and other invasive species to report observation to IMAP invasives, which is New York, New York State's invasive species database and community science platform. There is a free mobile app you can download into a smartphone and use it in the field to record your observations that provide a photograph to be reviewed by invasive species experts along with the location data. Or there's an online platform that you can report data to using a desktop computer. Both Slilo and the New York State Hemlock Initiative have special IMAP projects that you can request to join and select to filter your data. All HWA survey observations submitted until March 15th will be entered in the HWA Winter Mapping Challenge and you can win prizes. You can sign up for a free user account and you can get self-serve training resources at their website, nyimapinvasives.org and a link will be in your follow-up email. And a great way to get involved is to just volunteer. Slilo Prism has an invasive species volunteer surveillance network where we, we can train you to recognize and report invasive species threatening the Slilo region to IMAP. We do host special guided HWA survey trainings each winter to train and recruit volunteers to recognize and report Hemlock Willie Delgid. And these trainings are open to the public and we welcome our partners to send their seasonal staff to join us as well. 
We also have opportunities to assist terrestrial and aquatic invasive species removal and restoration efforts. We have a sign up form on our website or you can scan this QR code here and I'll share resources in your email. And a fun and easy way that you can get involved is to take the new Pledge to Protect, which is an outreach initiative that anyone can participate in. We have five pledge categories that you can um, pledge to protect. Each um, are themed for um, providing you with specific resources for those categories, lands, trails, waters, gardens, community, and forests. And once you take the pledge, you become a protector and you get monthly email blogs showcasing simple actions you can take to protect your favorite outdoor spaces from the impacts of invasive species. And you can also participate in games to win prizes. The New York State Hemlock Initiative also has volunteer opportunities where you can help search for and report HWA with their HWA Hunters program or you can help report the status of HWA infestations at the same site a couple times a year with their My Hemlock program. And we'll be sure to include links to these programs in your follow-up email. And you can learn more about Slilo Prism and the New York State Hemlock Initiative and connect with us on our websites and social media platforms. I do encourage all of you to subscribe to the Slilo Prism all-inclusive mailing list to receive our seasonal newsletter and invitations to events like today's webinar. And there'll be a link to subscribe that I'm gonna throw up in the chat and also in your follow-up email. And that concludes our presentation today. And I'd like to open the floor to any questions you may have. And on the screen are our contact information if you wanna jot those down. You want me to start answering the questions in the chat? Yeah, you can go ahead if, yep. Okay, um, Summer asked if there were synergistic effects when applying both chemicals. Um, there are additive effects because the dinotefuron works right away. And then right about the time that the dinotefuron burns out, the imidacloprid becomes effective. And so you have immediate control and then long-term control, long-term for an average of about five years. Um, she also asked if the neonicotinoids can affect other bee species. Um, because the bees are not interested in hemlocks because they don't produce nectar, there's not, we don't see how they would be impacting bee species. Um, there is a, is a reduction in the other canopy arthropods um, for a year or two, and that, but then they come back, none of them are wiped out completely even the HWA, sadly, but it does bring this HWA populations really, really far down. Um, and uh, yeah, um, another question that was related was, are, has anybody considered off-target impacts for soil life? Um, yes, uh, there's been some really good research done out of Tennessee and Georgia, where they use the soil drench application method uh, exclusively rather than um, the basal bark application that we use. And they have similarly, they've seen a reduction in a few of the soil arthropod um, taxa species, but none of them removed and only directly under the tree, not out from the tree. Um, Betsy asked if imidacloprid could be used on trees that grow over, near, and around a water source for humans, such as a spring. Um, the soil drench method, I think, and also definitely the basal bark method say, do not apply near water. But your, the definition of near is up to the applicator, as far as we can tell. Um, most of the EC and parks and um, the, Cornell Botanic Gardens have mostly used slightly different um, setbacks from streams. And then whenever they're treating directly above water or directly streamside or within their buffer of choice, they use stem injection where you actually drill a hole into the tree and put the chemical directly into the tree. So there's no, you know, sp splashing or runoff from applying to the tree trunk or um, movement 
down. Um, that's more like $10 per diameter inch for the stem injections um, versus two to five, two for the imidacloprid alone and five maybe at the very high end for um, the both of the chemicals together. Um, but you can do it. And um, imidacloprid uh, directly affects the nervous system of insects, which is completely different from a mammal insect system. And in um, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, it doesn't move very far in the soil. Um, there's been research done on that in the South and where they used soil drench again, not the basal bark application. So we, we would think that that would be okay. Um, what would be the impact on insect eating birds? Um, the birds don't eat dead bugs, so once the chemicals are effective, it's not going to be an impact for the birds. Um, and I have not seen ex direct research on that question, um, so I don't want to say anything categorical to answer that. Do you recommend treating with medical bird now before we have any evidence of HW in the county as a preventative? So in like the Wasco Lake watershed, um, where HWA is rampant, um, we, we are now saying, go ahead and treat preventatively. It's probably in your area and it'll be there anytime. We also, um, the more we survey and find HWA, we mostly find it several years into an infestation. We're not, we're not picking it up super early. Um, so in an area that's already well infested, we would say go ahead and treat preventatively. But in the case of Slilo, unless you're directly lakeside, right in the areas where we know HWA already is, I would probably survey first. Remember, it's gonna take your trees six to 20 years to, to really go down. So as long as you're watching them and you're um, tracking any like, hmm, canopy thinner than it used to be in several of these trees, maybe I should, Think that at that point I might I might treat treat ahead of time even if you haven't specifically picked up the HWA yet. But otherwise, I would say just just monitor your trees closely and uh, and wait until you start to see either signs of decline or you actually find the HWA before you treat. Um, aerial photography. You can use Google, uh, the Google Maps. Some of that aerial imagery is leaf off as in it was taken in the winter and so the conifers really show uh, but bing the bing search and the bing map for the bing search engine um that one usually has leaf off imagery so i would if if google doesn't work i would try bing um and then google, google also if you get google earth um you can pick different times for the aerial imagery and sometimes some of the older ones will, will be lethal. Listening up here in Bruns, New Brunswick, says Lindsay, is anyone still targeting seed collection as a long-term conservation strategy? The answer is yes, but I don't know a lot about it. Um, we did do a small grant a few years ago where we collected a bunch of hemlock cones um, and then sent them to a, a seed saving facility. I know New York Botanic Gardens has been working on that. I know DEC has been thinking about it, New York State DEC. Um, but I don't have any like up-to-date information in my brain to share on that. Sorry. Is there funding available for homeowners to treat their property? Um, it, that is a really hard question. Um, and gen usually the answer is no, there isn't. Um, but if you pull together this, these sort of um, watershed or some other small landscape scale group, people have successfully got funding through GLRI. And you can also apply to through DEC to a federal program. Um, I haven't seen that one work yet, but but it's it's another avenue you can try. And then um, aside from that, talking to your lake association or, you know, thinking about fundraising across the community might be a good idea. 
I'd also like to add on the funding note that I will be sharing a, a document that lists all of the available invasive species related funding sources in New York State on it. Excellent. And all of their links to their websites for you to learn more. Thank you very much. That's a great resource. Um, Summer says that hemlocks are pretty valuable given their ecosystem value, which I fully agree with. Are there alternative trees we can enrichment plant that will fill the gap? That is a Awesome question, and then something I lie awake thinking about at night. Uh, there's really not a good replacement for eastern hemlock that will serve all of those ecosystem services. But if your trees are uh, either already dead, if you live in the Catskills or the Lower Hudson, or you've decided where you're going to save trees and you just don't have the funding to treat all of your trees or all of your stands, and you know where the trees are going to go down, I would. I would love to see people plant things that are going to survive in the in the changing climate. Um, and I'm hoping to work with DEC and some other folks to come up with a good list for what what would make sense to enrichment plant in in areas that have hemlock. So stay tuned. I'm working on it. Um, can you hire someone to come and apply treatment? Absolutely. Um, Generally, if that would be an arborist or a tree services company. Um, we do have county by county. About six years ago, we, we just emailed everybody who had the appropriate DEC application license and said, hey, do you want to be included in a list? And so we have a list for every county. And if you email me, I will send you your county and the surrounding counties. I don't, because we haven't had HWF there very long, um, I don't have those people sitting right here in my brain. How far away is biocontrol for homeowners? Um, because we're still in the research stage, we generally don't release on private property. Um, we usually pre release on preserved lands, um, usually public access preserved lands. Um, so we don't have any biocontrol options right now. You, if you go online, you'll see people saying you can buy SASIS Sasuke for a biocontrol of HWA. We can tell you that, that that bug is easy to rear in the lab, and so it's easy to sell, but it does not establish in New York, and we've never seen it work um, in New York. So I would, I would not recommend that. Um, the other biocontrols are just um, there. You st I think you still need a, re a release permit to release them in New York. And um, they're very expensive to obtain. And so we're still we're still in the research stages for that. Um, but what you can do is work with a nearby uh, park or preserve and um, work with them to find hemlocks with HWA in the right stage for a biocontrol release and then talk with Lilo or talk with Naishi about um, about whether or not it would make sense to add that to our research program. Um, I guess I have a lot more questions in one more minute. How do you judge if a tree is too far gone to treat? Um, we usually say 30% canopy or less uh, is not necessarily going to survive. You can give it a Hail Mary treatment. Uh, State Parks has done a lot of trees that are under that cutoff because they were really important to the park and some of them made it. So it can work, but that's our, usually the cutoff is 30%. Can. I think um, Jeff said, I think you think the, you said the permit process limits the amount of total diameter a property can treat. It's actually a per acre uh, limit. So I didn't communicate that very clearly. It's about 180 inches per diameter inches per acre. Uh, it's about $2 right now per diameter inch for imidacloprid only. Um, maybe less, maybe $1.50. And then the dinotefuron has been caught up in the like inflation of chemical prices, uh, possibly due to the war in Ukraine. Um, and it's gone up just a bunch, like three times in the last year. So it's probably more like $5 per diameter inch for a tank mix. Hopefully you don't need a tank mix in your area because HWA is really new in, in your part of New York. 
Hopefully you can just do them at a club. How is HWA most likely to be moved around? Um, it gets, we're pretty sure it's moving on bird's feet and uh, maybe on other animals. Uh, people can move it, definitely gets moved on uh, when people plant HW, hemlocks that are infested with HWA that they bought at a big box store and were raised in Tennessee or something like that. That's how it wound up in Buffalo and in Rochester. We recommend that if you're gonna take trees down, you limb them and leave the branches in place and maybe just limit the amount of management and activities that you do in infested stands between the months of, March, months of March when the egg laying starts ish and like early July, because that's when the crawlers are out. Donna says, we're also conducting soil non-target effects in Nova Scotia. Wonderful, I'm so happy to hear that. Is there a downloadable what to consider worksheet? Uh, I don't have one yet. It's a great, I mean, that's the prioritization tool, really. That's the that's the downloadable worksheet. Yes, Bing is the other um, image image source. And it they they often have the leaf off imagery. They they uh, work with a, with an organization called Pictometry, I think, that that's providing their imagery. And they always do leaf off. I mentioned 400 wildlife that use the tree. Are there specific insects that exclusively use it? There are some spiders that are found in, in the hemlock canopies that are not found, found elsewhere that I know of for sure. Uh, and certainly HWA, HWA uses it exclusively. Um, there are probably others, but I would say that the um, canopy arthropods are not well studied, and I don't think we have a good answer for that. Um, the definition of old growth is a fairly technical definition. You can download a, uh, a two-page sheet from the Natural Heritage Program that will walk you through all of the de definitions for old growth. And that's why I focus more on primary Primary hemlock would be big trees and um, a pit and mound topography. So not flat ground, but, but places where trees have tipped up and then the decomposed and left little piles and holes in the ground of soil. And that's all the questions. Thank you for hanging on for the extra three minutes. And um, I apologize for running a little bit over during the question and answer session. Yes, thank you for joining us. And uh, as mentioned, we will be sending out an email with a recording and lots of resources for you. I've jotted down uh, resources to answer some of the questions that were in the chat, and I will add that to the email as well. Thank you for joining I, us. Thank you. Okay, I do have one other thing to say, which is that um, our research program, because we have to go back and revisit sites where we release biocontrols to find out if it established or not, like we are already completely swamped with release locations. I'm sure we'll be doing more in Silo because it's a new area, but we're definitely not going to come to every small natural area in the Silo region. So, so I'm sorry, but yeah. we'd still like to know if you have a beautiful property near you that's public and that you think would make a good release site once, once HWA arrives. Thank okay. you guys so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.